My very dearest, we follow the steps of our Lord's passion and death. We contemplate the death our Lord suffered for love of us. This is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. You have purchased us, O Lord Jesus, with your blood. You have purchased us. Now on the eve of Good Friday, Jesus, knowing that the hour had come for him to go forth from this world and return to his Father, having loved his own, the apostles, who were in the world, he loved them to the end. He gave the greatest possible proof of love that it is possible to give. And this love of Jesus for him evoked in Paul that, that shout, even if it's on paper, even if he wrote it instead of shouting it, as I'm sure he shouted it many a time, God forbid that I should glory other than in the cross of Jesus Christ, my Lord. My very dearest, Jesus has given us so much love. What could my Jesus do more? Can God himself, who knows all things, could he possibly give us more than he gave? He is so aflame with love for us. And we are the ones with the frigid hearts. We are the ones with ice water in our veins. Actually, it's so sad when people say, Where was God? Why didn't he show love for me? What else could God himself possibly do? Leaving untouched, that is to say, free, your free will. He shall never take that away. Short of that, which he will never do, he respects his own creation. What else, what else could God have possibly done? God so loved the world that he handed over his only begotten son. What else? So that all who will look up and give their hearts to Jesus in repentance for their sins, may not die eternally, but have eternal life. And what else could Jesus have done? Oh my, on the eve of his death, he gives us his body to eat and his blood to drink. And then from the cross, he looks down and he sees his mother. And he has not shared her yet. At least he has not announced it. And now he does. He says to John, his best friend, who was in front of him on the cross, first he said to his mother, Woman, behold thy son. Then he said to John, who was standing in for all of us, we weren't born yet, but John stood in for us. This is for every one of us as an individual. Behold, your mother. He gave us his body and blood. He gave us his mother. He gave us the teaching that he brought down from heaven. He took upon himself all our sins. What else is there that even God can possibly do? There is no more. And yet as we shall see, Throughout history, he's found ways, he's found ways to announce it again and again and again through his church, through EWTN, oh yes, through miracles, through apparitions approved by the church. Come to me, come, come, all you who are heavy laden and can't stand it anymore, and I will refresh you. Now, the very truth of the matter is that God is all love and has shown all love and it's we human beings 
that have been blocks of ice. It's not the other way around. What did we give him? Scourges until there was not a sound piece on all of his body. Scourges from the neck to the feet. Wounds upon wounds. You know, the Roman scourges were multiple strands of leather coming out from a handle. And at, at the end of each of the strands of leather, the Romans would tie a piece of jagged dry bone or a piece of steel, not unlike a tiny length of barbed wire, so that when the leather whip fell and pulled away, it would pull the flesh apart. And that's just what happened. You know, a sentence to a Roman scourging was a sentence of death. People did not survive Roman scourgings. And three big, strong Roman legionaries, specialists in how to scourge people to death, beat Jesus until their arms fell with exhaustion. And then the thorns. And then the cross on the shoulder, a heavy cross. He had had nothing to eat or drink since the last supper the night before. And the spittle. And even after he died, right in the presence of his mother, a soldier said, Don't bother breaking this one's legs, he's dead already. And that spear had to go through her immaculate soul before it went into his heart. They shall gaze upon him whom they have pierced. Do you know, a human being can only lose a certain amount of blood and he dies. I have heard that it's about half of the blood supply of the individual body. If you fall any lower than that, the shock is so great that there's no way to survive. Now Jesus, there's no crucifix that shows it, was wound upon wound, hanging pieces of flesh. It becomes apparent on the Shroud of Turin. And he bled, and he bled from the thorns in the head, from the wounds, five principal ones in his body, plus countless wounds and openings. And every one of those openings is like a thousand mouths that shouts out, love me, love me, love me. He's like a divine rag picker going around begging for love. you can only lose a certain amount of blood then you die now when that spear went in John saw blood and water and the water that he saw very well squares with contemporary data especially in the chest of a tormented person there's what looks like a sack of water it's something very very aqueous when it comes out of Jesus' side, it looks like water. And John said, I saw blood, the little bit that was left. And water. Water, baptism. Blood, Eucharist. Even after he's dead, he finds a way to say, I love you, how can you doubt? We are the ones who have been called. How could Jesus have survived so late without dying? It was a miracle. It was a miracle. Just as the angel refreshing him in the garden the night before had kept him alive, his father kept him alive on the cross. And he kept himself alive. I'll tell you a detail about that. You see, all these scriptures are orders that God the Father gave to his son. All of these scriptures. 
For instance, the one that says, In my thirst they gave me vinegar to drink. And Jesus knew on the cross, there's the one prophecy that I haven't fulfilled yet. There's the one act of obedience I have not carried out yet. Not because of lack of will to obey, because I do always the things that are pleasing to my Father. But the soldiers just hadn't pressed the sponge to his mouth. And so Jesus, seeing a pail of vinegar, says, I thirst. I suppose looking right at the pail. My very dears, it means several things. It doesn't mean that he's complaining because his tongue from the dryness is stuck to the roof of his mouth. Jesus doesn't complain. He was willing, he was anxious, he was desirous to suffer at all. What does that mean then? I thirst. St. Cyprian in the first centuries, I think in the 300s, said it very clearly. Allow me to say it in Latin. Citit citiri Deus. God thirsts to be thirsted for. God thirsts to be thirsted for. And as little St. Teresa says, the only way to slake the thirst of God is by loving Him. His I thirst was another way for him to say love me can you not see that I love you but the immediate meaning is I must obey this last order I thirst so they stuck a, a sponge soaked in that vinegar and gall put it on the spear, held it up to his mouth. He wouldn't drink it. You know, that gall was just slightly soporific. And if he had drunk that, he would have felt the pain a little bit less. That's why it says Jesus didn't drink it. Not from rebellion. It was in order not to suffer an ounce less. Oh, that there be, are there cowardly members of a thorn-crowned thorn head? So he loves us so much. And we're the ones who have given him back, in return, coldness, sacrilegious communions. Every time I see in the churches what I call the communion traffic cops, you know, walking down the aisle like this, ushering people out, you know, who's going to resist pressure like that? That gesture itself, the worst conceivable pastoral, or pastoral idea, just sets up mass sacrilege in the churches at Sunday Mass. Jesus is maltreated with sacrilege, with the loss of all consciousness of sin, with forgetfulness of him. He stays alone such long hours. Now, when the priest leans over the altar at Mass and says, Take and eat, this is my body. Take and drink, this is my blood. That bread, that wine, does not become a symbol of Jesus. Oh, no. It is Jesus himself. So many people, I just hope innocently, do not know that this is really Jesus. It is he. He didn't say at the Last Supper, take and eat, this represents my body. He didn't say, take and drink, this is a symbol of my blood. He used the verb is. Take and eat, this is my body, and yet it's the same one that's being handed over for you. Take and drink, this is my blood, the same blood that's being poured out for you. 
You know, there was a miracle once in Italy, in a town on the way between Rome and San Giovanni Rotondo. It happened in a town called Lanciano. I can't place the year exactly, but it was something like 719. 719. There was a friar who was also a priest who was doubting the real presence of Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament. And now listen. The host consecrated. Consecrated. I'm not going to say it became flesh because the consecrated host is flesh took on the fullness of the appearance of flesh. It's flesh already. No? It's not material bread anymore. Take and eat. This is my body. But Jesus, in order to confirm for this priest that this is his real presence, his true body, and in this chalice is his true blood. Jesus in the host, the host itself, took on the appearance of flesh. You see, a consecrated host is Jesus, living and true, but it looks like bread. This consecrated host stopped looking like bread and began to look like what it is. Now they've done blood tests because it's all covered with blood and it's in the shape of the heart, four chambers. They've identified the tissue is uh, myocardium the blood is type AB the same as is found in strains upon the holy shroud of Turin and to this day it is almost 1300 years later you can go to that town on the road between Rome and San Giovanni Rotundo which is where Father Pio did most of his apostolate and visit this church where the miracle persists to this day. The host itself has the formation and the appearance and the bloodiness of a heart. And so has Jesus repeatedly. It really isn't necessary that he do so because the faith itself should be enough as St. Thomas says, your sense of taste doesn't help you. It tastes like bread. Your sense of smell doesn't help you because it smells like a little piece of bread. Your eyes don't help you because it looks like a little piece of bread. The only sense that helps you is the sense of hearing because you hear Jesus say take and eat this is my flesh take and drink this is my blood and he did say the bread that I shall give is my flesh for the life of the world oh my very dearest let us not press into his heart the thorn of his having to think they do not believe me. Isn't this like the culmination, my very dearest? That he had to go, he had to go back to heaven. And he wanted to leave as a remembrance. You know, when a mom is dying, I know a mother superior, so beloved by all the nuns, she was a foundress back home in Puerto Rico. And uh, when she was dying, she left her thimble to one of the nuns and that sister was so pleased she said the mother left me her thimble that she'd sew with and so Jesus was going back to heaven and he wanted to leave a remembrance and he would not he was not willing to leave any remembrance at all except himself Jesus was unwilling to leave any remembrance except himself his own person his body his blood, his soul, his divinity, even the fullness of all his merits. And he emptied himself. St. Paul says that. Jesus 
emptied himself. You know, that's just the opposite of the way the culture of death is going now. Really, really. You know, it's, it's out there with very, very few exceptions. Very few people are saved from the following. I have to find myself. I have to establish myself. I have to polish my self-image without being converted. Just convince myself I'm the greatest. And you have Jesus, Paul says it, emptying himself. He emptied himself. That being in the form of God, that is to say, being God himself, the second person of the Blessed Trinity, he emptied himself of all outward manifestation of his divinity. He looked like any neighbor. Noemi down the block in Nazareth would not have said, I'm going to go down to God's carpenter shop. I need a dining room set. Nobody said, I think I'll go to God's carpenter shop. I'm going to go see Joseph. Oh, Joseph died, then I'll see his son, Jesus. And Jesus will make me a dining room set. The son of Joseph. Now the day came, I was telling you that as the centuries went on, Jesus was trying to find ways to renew his people's faith in him. It shouldn't be necessary. Events like Fatima should not really be necessary. It's like a shaking up that comes from heaven, a very special manifestation in no way contrary to the gospel, rather meant by heaven to bring out the gospel all over again. But among these many apparitions, fully approved by the church, there are those apparitions in the 17th century to St. Margaret Mary Alokok. She was a nun and she was praying one day and Jesus, all six foot of him, in all his beauty, and he is the most beautiful of the sons of men, that virginal man, son of that virginal mother, Jesus appeared to her. And it was Jesus. And the church does accept this after much study, this has been long as approved as can be. And he took those strong carpenter's fingers and he pressed them through flesh and between ribs and pulled ribs and flesh apart and uncovered his heart. And he said to Margaret Mary, Behold, Look at this heart which has loved men so much. And the heart was all aflame. And he appeared to her several times. And she saw wounds all over his heart. There was one particularly painful wound, painful to look at, and she was horrified at the sight of that wound. And she said, Lord, that wound? And Jesus said, that wound is inflicted by those who live in my household. He was not, of course, referring to Mary Immaculate and to Holy Saint Joseph. He was referring to those who throughout the ages living under the same roof with Jesus, even in some cases having been given his own priesthood by holy orders, did not love him, did not spread the gospel, did not keep their vows. And Jesus said, that wound, Mary, 
that wound was administered to me by those of my own household. All the things that Jesus suffered. And he asked St. Margaret Mary Alokok to have the devotion to his sacred heart spread all over the world. And she did. She did have that devotion spread all over the world. Even from her little contemplative convent in France, she did. Behold the heart, Jesus said to her, which has so loved men that it has spared nothing, even to exhausting and consuming itself, in order to testify its love. And in return, I receive from the greater part only ingratitude by their irreverence and sacrilege, by the coldness and contempt they have for me in this sacrament of love. But what I feel most keenly is that it is hearts which are consecrated to me that treat me thus. So I ask of you that the Friday after the octave of Corpus Christi be set aside as a special feast in honor of my heart by receiving Holy Communion on that day and making reparation to my heart by a solemn act in order to make amends for the indignities which I have received during the time that my heart has been exposed on the altars. I promise you that my heart shall expand itself to shed in abundance the influence of its divine love upon those who shall thus honor it because my heart is to be honored and adored. And then, in our own days, I was a small child when this happened. In our own days, Jesus manifested himself to St. Faustina. He manifested himself <coughs> with two streams coming out of his heart, two streams of rays, white rays and pinkish rays. And he said to her, the white rays mean that mercy, that mercy that takes a person out of mortal sin and introduces them into divine love, takes away mortal sin and introduces them to divine love. The pinkish rays, the reddish rays, Jesus explained to Sister Faustina, mean that mercy of mine which converts people from barely constituted in my love into great lovers of me. The white rays, the mercy of conversion, to begin to love Jesus. The white rays then are going to mean that mercy of Jesus by which you set aside the things that so afflict him. Just to mention a few, laziness about mass. That is to say, the practical refusal to listen to the commandment of God. Remember, keep holy the Sabbath day. The commandment of God, take and eat. This is my body. The mercy that takes away the sin of having answered him, perhaps for many years, I don't want to take and eat your body. I don't want to take and drink your blood. I just want to do what I please. That is very offensive to him. 
So the white rays coming out of Jesus' breast mean that mercy which takes us out of sin, be it resistance to the Eucharist, that is to say to the sacrifice of the Mass, be it adultery, be it in the single state that not adhering to a single person's chastity, but stealing what belongs to marriage without the sacrament of marriage, or the use of drugs, or the falling into drunkenness in its worst state. The, the whitish rays mean that mercy of Jesus that takes you out of sin and constitutes you in his sanctifying grace as a child of God, as a brother or sister of Jesus Christ, as a living temple of the Holy Spirit, as a member of the Christ, mystical body of Christ in the grace of God, not dead weight member of the church, but a living, vibrating member of the church. That grace which makes you pleasing to God, makes you a friend of God, makes you an heiress or an heir of heaven. That mercy that constitutes you in His grace, if you come back to Him, setting aside mortal sin, that's the white rays. And the pinkish rays are that additional mercy which after he has brought you back into his grace converts you into a perfect lover of him and I say to you that there is nothing more felicitous for a human being nothing more devoutly to be wished for than to love Jesus Christ perfectly because he so loves us. Jesus did further on, on this occasion, ask that there be a feast of his mercy. Ask that it be the Sunday immediately following Easter Sunday, the Sunday immediately following the resurrection. And Jesus asked that there be a novena a novena which in many churches is being practiced. A novena that starts on Good Friday, the day of Jesus' death, and goes on nine days, you could count them, from that Good Friday to the next Friday, Friday of Easter week, would be eight days, and then that final Saturday would be the ninth day, and the following day, the Sunday, one week after Easter, is the Feast of Divine Mercy. Such are the efforts that Jesus has made, miraculous efforts that Jesus has made to get us to pay attention. And we do know that he does listen. That if enough people fall in love with him, if enough people make the decision to set aside mortal sin and feeling unable to, if they'll just say, Jesus, have mercy on me. Jesus, I trust in you. They will receive from him the grace to set aside all mortal sin and begin to walk with Him, begin to love Him, begin to treat with Him familiarly, affectionately, the way true friends treat one another. And so, may I beg of you to set aside, set aside utterly, anything evil in your life and come to Jesus and say Jesus I want to be yours I don't want to have any affection any love except that which is pleasing to you no love I must tell you is really love unless it comes from Jesus and takes you back to Jesus Anything that separates you from Him is not love. People call it love, but it's just the opposite. How can anything be love if it crucifies Him? That which crucifies Him cannot possibly be love. People do call it love, but they're twisting perhaps the most beautiful word in the language. Nothing is love except what comes from Him 
and carries us back to Him. And so, yank out of your heart, no matter how painful the yanking is, all that is displeasing to Jesus, and decide that you are His, you shall be His, and if there is something in your life that you feel that you cannot give up, and it's something that He forbids, then ask Him, beg Him. He has said, He said this to St. Faustina, the greater, the more heinous a person's sins are, the greater claim in justice he has upon my merciful heart. May I say that again? The greater a person's sins are, the greater his claim upon the mercy of my merciful heart. Because I have come that they may have life. I have come that they may set aside death and receive my life. Eternal Father, we offer you the most sacred body and blood, soul and divinity of your dearly beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, in atonement for our sins and those of the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. Holy God, Holy Mighty One, Holy Immortal One, have mercy on us and on the whole world. Holy God, Holy Mighty One, Holy Immortal One, have mercy on us and on the whole world. Holy God, Holy Mighty One, Holy Immortal One, have mercy on us and on the whole world. My very dearest, when Jesus spoke to Saint Margaret Mary, he did so very, very clearly. Ask for consecration to his sacred heart. And so now with you, I want to renew my consecration to the Sacred Heart of Jesus. Would you please kneel? We shall first entone this ancient beautiful hymn, Pange Lingua. Mm -hmm. Pange Lingua Listen, we beg of you to our act of total consecration of ourselves, of our lives, to your sacred heart. We give you thanks for your apparitions to St. Margaret Mary. And with all our hearts, we wish to renew our consecration to you. I, Father Pablo, I give and consecrate to the sacred heart of our Lord Jesus Christ my person and my life, 
my actions, penances, and sufferings, that my whole being may be devoted to honoring, loving, and glorifying Him. It is my irrevocable will to be entirely His and to do everything for His love, renouncing with my whole heart whatever may displease Him. I take Thee then, O most sacred heart, as the sole object of my love, as the protector of my life, and as the pledge of my salvation, as the remedy of my frailty and inconstancy, as the repairer of all the defects of my life, and as my secure refuge in the hour of death. Be then, O heart of goodness, my justification before God the Father, and remove far from me the thunderbolts of his just wrath. O heart of love, I place my whole confidence in thee. While I fear all things from my malice and frailty, I hope in all things from thy goodness. Consume then in me whatever can displease or be opposed to thee. And may thy pure love be so deeply impressed upon my heart that it may be impossible that I should ever be separated from thee or forget thee. I implore thee by all thy goodness that my name may be written in thee. For in thee I wish to place all my happiness and all my glory living and dying in very bondage to thee. Amen. In supreme nocte cene re cum fratribus observata lege plene civis in legalibus civum turbe duodene sedat suis manibus Verbum caro panem verum, verbo carnem eficit, ficue sanguis Christi merum, et si sensus deficit. Ad firmandum cor sincerum, sola fide sufficit. My very dearest, there are three mysteries. We must always think of three marvelous mysteries. They all happened on Holy Thursday. First I'll tell you what they are, and then we'll go to each of them again. Jesus said the first Mass and gave us the Eucharist. Jesus instituted the priesthood, the sacrament of the priesthood. And thirdly, Jesus gave us the new commandment that we love one another as he has loved us. They happened in this order. First, the new commandment that we love one another as he loves us. Second, that first Eucharist. And third, the conferring of his own priesthood upon his apostles. We're going to contemplate these three marvelous mysteries one by one. First of all, that commandment, a new commandment I give you, that you love one another as I love you. 
Jesus loved gestures. You know that. His speech is so picturesque, so concrete. You know how he says things like, it's easier, it's easier for a, a camel to jump through the hole in a needle than for someone who's attached to riches to enter into the kingdom of heaven. Oh, his speech is full of little children that play the flute, and they play the flute in the plaza. Can you imagine such picturesque language? And they say, we play dirges and nobody weeps. We play dances and nobody dances. And then the hand with the chicks under her wings. Jesus is always doing gestures. He is, after all, with his Father and with the Holy Spirit, the maker of these physical things. And he contemplated them all his life long. When he was a small child, he'd say, Oh, my father, you made the hen with an instinct to stay close to the lady's house. And you made the hen with an instinct to, to scream out in joy when she lays an egg so that the mother can go out and find the egg because maybe her little fellow is sick and she wants to prepare an egg for him. He was just constantly glorifying his father in creation. And above all, in the most beautiful of material things that God has made the human being. So we're not to be surprised that Jesus is constantly having recourse to gestures, physical gestures. Here he is at the Last Supper. There were several layers of tunics on him. He took off the outer layer, which left a kind of a belt here. He set hand to a towel, tucked it in the belt, filled the basin with water, and went around that table of the Last Supper, washing their feet. They couldn't get over it. Peter, in fact, said, you wash my feet? You're not going to wash my feet. And Jesus said, Peter, if I don't wash your feet, you'll have nothing to do with me. And Peter really sounds like Peter, doesn't he? Well, if that's the case, don't just wash my feet. Wash my hands and my face. <laughs> and Jesus says, no, he was clean, only he needs to have his feet washed. And you are clean, but not all of you. And so after he had washed their feet carefully and dried them with the towel he had around his waist, carefully between one toe and the next, he set the basin of water and the towel aside, put back that outermost tunic over his shoulders, and he sat down and he said, you see what I've done? You people call me Lord and Master. And it's right that you do so because I am. Now, if I, who am the Lord and Master, have washed your feet, should not you? You must wash one another's feet. I've given you an example so that you would follow it. A new commandment I give you, that you love one another as I love you. Jesus is saying, do not let your likes and dislikes enslave your soul to the point where you can only love people that you like, to the point where you can only love people that you find interesting, to the point where you can only love with a false love of self-interest. Love one another as I have loved you. And if you try to find out how did he love us, do you think he loved his apostles because they were such brilliant people that always caught on right away? Oh my! Do you think he loved them because of their cultural accomplishments? They were all the time doing things that he could have dismissed them for. Like after so many months, maybe a year or so with Jesus, they're still saying, when he comes out of political power, who's going to be number two right his right hand side? Can you imagine a conversation between them? 
I'm the one that knows how to speak in public. And the other one's saying, I'm the one that knows how to handle the money. And the other one's saying, I know how when we walk into a town to see who's who and to manipulate the leadership of the town. And when they get to the town where they're going, Jesus said, you three, what were you talking about on the way? And they couldn't find a bush to hide behind. And Jesus had every right to say, why don't you go home now? Go back to your fish nets. You know, I'll get some more people. You know, no. He said, he who would be first in the kingdom of heaven must be the tiniest, the smallest, the least. And he said, I myself didn't come to be served. I came to serve and to lay down my life as a rescue for all. You know, if one person loves another for the advantage he can pull out of him, be it financial or kicks, whatever, just for the advantage you can pull out of that person, that is not love. That is not love. Now how does Jesus love us? Jesus loves us looking for our good. You love a person when you're looking out for that person's good. Otherwise you don't love the person. You're just in it for something else. A new commandment I give you that you love one another as I have loved you. And that's the way those first Christian people in Jerusalem by the way the two words Catholic and Christian if understood each of them in their fullness are perfectly coextensive mean exactly the same if each is used in the fullness of its sense that's the way they lived loving one another then they sat down to table and among other things Jesus with six on this side and six on this side you've seen the last supper so many times takes the bread in his hands and you know take and eat this is my body which is being given up for you take and drink this is my blood which is being poured out for you. Oh Jesus, oh Jesus, how did you do it? You are God, you are God, do you not know all things in anticipation of their happening? Did you not know of the violence against the sacred host, of hosts being scattered on the floor? of hosts being carted off for sacrilege, of consecrated hosts being taken to places of demonic cult. Jesus, how did you do it? How, how could you do it? How could you subject yourself to such indignities? Jesus, did you not foresee? You are God. Did you perhaps not foresee? You cannot have failed to foresee all the sacrileges. Jesus, nobody in confession to accuse themselves of their sin and every, um, everybody almost by forced march coming to receive you. Jesus, did you not foresee that? Why then did you commit the madness madly in love madly in love of saying, take and eat, this is my body, take and drink, this is my blood. You placed your love for me above the exigencies of your own divine glory. You placed, you placed your own divine glory beneath my welfare. You were willing to put up with all of that in order to give me the grace that the day would come when I would give myself entirely and without reserve to you. Oh, the Eucharist. I speak not poetically, but rather factually. There is nothing on the face of the earth 
greater than the Eucharist. There is nothing on the face of the earth greater than the holy sacrifice of the Mass. The Holy Father, who topples communist regimes, and just give him a few years, he'll take care of China too. He's so great. He shall be known as John Paul the Great. Do you know what is the greatest thing that he does? He says Mass. The Pope says Mass. Nobody can do anything greater than that. There is nothing on the face of the earth greater than the Mass. There is nothing in heaven greater than the Mass. And you say, but Father, God is in heaven. God is the sacred host offered up, not figuratively. His sacrifice is placed before us again. And after he made that sacrifice, reaching his hand out that Thursday night, he reached his almighty hand forward until the next afternoon, Good Friday afternoon, and brought that saving death onto that altar of the table of the Last Supper. And he made his saving death present. And just as on Holy Thursday night, Jesus reached some 18 hours into the future and brought his death and put it there, though it hadn't occurred yet, so in every Mass, Jesus reaches his hand to that Calvary that occurred almost 2,000 years ago and brings it here. And he did not finish that Last Supper without failing to say to his apostles, do this in memory of me. Do what? Offer the sacrifice. And Jesus cannot give a command without giving the sacrament that enables the man to do it. I am Father Pablo, Catholic priest, not because I studied a whole lot, but because the church, the bishop, the successor of the apostles, ordained me a priest. Not for my glory, but for the glory of God. Do believe how marvelous Jesus washes our feet. Jesus gives us the Mass. Jesus gives us the priesthood.